Welcome back to Canine Conversations. Happy Thanksgiving, you all. And I'm very, very happy here, you all. It sounds like I'm from South, and but I kind of lived in Florida for a long time. So y- you all, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. How about that? This is Canine Conversations, the podcast where we talk about dogs. We talk with dog lovers and two dog lovers. I hope you guys are all dog lovers. And if you're not, get off the show. Just don't even listen to this. If you don't love dogs, this is just not the show for you. So anyway, um, got a lot of stuff to cover today. First of all, today's show is sponsored by Fi Collar. The Fi Collar is the GPS collar that I use on my dogs. It's a great collar. It it syncs with your phone, your Android, your your iPhone. You can find out where your dog is at all times. You can track them down pretty much like to the, to the, to the house where they are. I've done a little experiment between here and, and Janet's house. It works fantastic. The Fi Collar, Fi Collar, go to tryfi.com, T-R-Y-F-I.com, and put in the discount code Robert Cabral. Robert Cabral, that will save you $25 off the purchase of the collar. It's an incredible deal. You'll love this collar. I was always looking for a good GPS collar. I found it. It's the Fi Collar. You're going to love it. Anyway, today I want to talk about holidays with dogs. There's a couple different topics to cover, a couple different aspects of the topic to cover, I should actually say. And, um, you know, first of all, let's look at Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a day to give thanks, to be grateful, to, uh, you know, we, we meet our families and our friends. We have festive food. We, we share great stories, and we're thankful. So it's not a day to really complain about stuff you don't have. It's a day to give thanks for what you do have. And I used to always say, you know, I give thanks to God for what I don't have as much as I give thanks to God for what I do have. And, you know, like when you don't have things, you don't have whatever it is. You don't have a disease. You don't have bills. You don't have, you know, uh, anybody hunting you or trying to kill you. You don't have, you know, you have a home. You don't have a big home, so you don't have those bills and those problems that go along with it. I never wish to be somebody that I'm not. So I'm really against all these, you know, internet gurus telling you, you know, about success and all this stuff. It's all a bunch of bullshit. Just, you know, just be happy. That's how you, that's the, the key to success is to be happy and not aspire to be, you know, Jeff Bezos. And no offense to Jeff if you're listening, but, you know, I don't, I don't care to be a billionaire or, or to have an airplane or anything like that. I aspire to just be happy. And in that, every day I give thanks for what I have and what I don't have. That's the important component to really think about. So anyway, let's look at, um, you know, how many dogs are in shelters and how grateful your dog is to have you and how grateful you should be to have your dog. Just think about it. The years that you spend with your dog are never enough. It's just never, never enough because the last day when they take their last breath, it just, you know what, I wish I would have thrown the ball one more time or I wish I would have petted him one more time or loved him one more time or taken him for one more walk. And you overlook a lot of those things when you, you know, you're working. I'm sitting here doing a podcast and Goofy's nudging my leg and I'm telling him, hey, stop it. But that's stupid, right? That's really idiotic because that should come first. My love for him, my love for my family, my love for my fiance, my pets, you know, and my friends should come before anything really monetary or, or so indiscriminate like, like that. So, so just take that minute, take that, that minute and just say, you know, wow. I'm really grateful to have you. You, you know, you could have, you, maybe you came, maybe the dog came from a, a, a pound like Bosman, or maybe he came from a breeder like Goofy and, you know, and Jimmy and, uh, and Dwayne actually, and Jimmy came from a, anyway, it's a long story. But, you know, give thanks for that. Be grateful for your pets. Be grateful for that you have them. And, uh, and I think it'll make, you know, make life a lot better. Let's talk about something here. And that is during the holidays, there's three different components that go on. The first one is, you're staying at home, you know, and you're going to have people over or you're going to go to somebody else's house. The second one is you're traveling with your dog. And the third one is you're going to leave your dog with a sitter or a boarder or something like that. So I want to talk about all those aspects and really kind of hit on a few of them because there's some really important components to think about. So first of all, you know, before I talk about any of these things, if you have an older dog, like we have Bosman, he's 17 years old, that requires special attention. In other words, it, it's not like, oh, we're going to leave him with a border or we're going to take him with us. There's a lot of special things to think about when you have an older dog or a dog that requires special care. So don't just you know, make it, d- dismiss it like, oh, he's just another dog. Older dogs need a lot more attention, even more so than young puppies. Puppies are really, it's good to get them with other people because they're going to acclimate. They're going to learn things. Sometimes they learn bad things, which you don't really want to do. So be careful with that. But an older dog, you know, Boz is very frail. He's blind. He's deaf. You know, we can't leave him around with the stairs or other dogs might bump him or anything like that. So there's a lot of these special things we think about with Bosman 
And that's what you should think about if you have an older dog, irrelevant of the size of the dog. But let's look at, um, you're staying home, you can have some friends over for Thanksgiving or Christmas or Hanukkah or, or you know, Kwanzaa or you know, or Ramadan, whatever holiday you're celebrating. Let's say you're going to have people over and you need to understand, do these people know dogs? Do they like dogs? Do they understand dogs? Do they understand? And is your dog really, you know, the balanced kind of dog that can be just, you know, totally benign? Jimmy. Jimmy is the most easy dog. There's no issues with kids or old people or young people or, you know, he's just perfect. But that's the exception. Now, we have Maya, Goofy, and Dwayne, who are not the exception. They are high energy. They get excited. They, you know, they'll play with people. They'll knock somebody over. They'll eat food off the plate. And, you know, will these people that you're going to have over overexcite your dog will they start playing with them playing tug with them or getting them really excited and then the dog's all jacked up in prey drive and then you can't, you can't eat and that's really not that uncommon right that will happen quite a bit and you want to make sure that you kind of you know preempt that you don't want your dog you know getting crazy because that's not a good way for the dog to be you want to think about the dog having a really nice chill experience and if they can't do that then you might want to consider putting the dog in a crate or having a friend watch him or just putting him in another room while people are over. That's not the end of the world. It's probably a really good idea. Give him a really yummy treat, a Kong, a bone or something to chew, and let them have some chill time. But um, the other thing, too, is when you have people over, you got to worry, are they going to feed him table scraps? Are they going to feed your dog table scraps? And if they do, you've got a problem. Certain foods, I'm going to tell you right now, very, very rich foods. Now, a piece of turkey here and there is not going to hurt your dog. I feed my dog turkey all the time. They always put turkey on the list. The, I, and I give my dog turkey necks, raw, frozen raw turkey necks. But what I would really strongly encourage you to say to guests is that the dog gets no table scraps, nothing. Because given too many table scraps, and if this one feeds him a little bit of turkey, and this one gives him some gravy, this one gives him some cranberries, this one gives him some roast beef and some ham and some of this and some of that, then you're going to have a problem. Your, your dog is going to get sick. It's going to get pancreatitis. And you're going to be taking the dog to the vet and putting the dog on medicine. The dog's going to feel horrible that, you know, a few hours later. So no table scraps whatsoever during the holidays because it, it inevitably gets out of control. Now, Goofy and Maya, they lick my oatmeal bowl in the morning and Jimmy and Boz and everybody gets a little bit of oatmeal or a blueberry or something like that. No big deal. It's done within moderation, within reason. So it's not that hard. But... Your dogs, your dog, dog or dogs need to have a place to kind of get away. They don't need to be under everybody's feet and, and nudging at the table and begging at the table and, and getting petted and, you know, little kids giving them rolls under the table, chocolate. Um, any of those things can be really, really bad for the dog. So think about that right away. You know, if you're going to have people over, are they going to be chill? Are they going to be cool with your dog? Is your dog going to be cool with them? And if they're not, just put the dog away. Don't put, don't, you know, put your dog up to that um, risk of something happening from something to eat, something they get. And worse yet, leaving a door open and the door running out, the dog running out the door, and you can't find him. You don't know where he is for an hour or two hours. Get hit by a car. You know, anything can happen. So safety, safety, safety first. We're going to talk about safety and all these other issues right so really be careful table scraps be careful the door being open and and that i would consider crating the dog i would really consider um you know giving the dog some time out maybe taking the dog out say hi to everybody then you can go back in your crate or whatever watch for kids kids will notoriously jump on try to ride the dog try to hug the dog if your dog doesn't like it it's going to bite somebody and you don't want that protect your dog first and foremost and protect your guests from any situation that could happen that's step one. Step two is going to be traveling with your dog. So you're going to go see some friends. You're going to go, maybe you're going to go drive, you know, to a couple, 100 miles, 200 miles, take your dog with you. You're going to stay in a hotel or you're going to stay with your friends. And you've got to consider when your dog's in the car with you, how safe is the dog? And that's a really big thing to think about. I use crash tests at safety crates in my car because it's that important to me. You know, we have a van where we can take all the dogs, we can take, you know, either Janet or my car, and we can put the dogs in the crates, and they're always, always, always in a crate. You know, at the very least, what you should do is get yourself like a really good crash-tested harness, those safety harnesses. There's a couple of them out there that are really good. Some say this one isn't as safe as that one. You know, if it's a major fatal collision, it's not going to matter anyway. But the idea is you don't want your dog, you know, dangling their head out the window and then jumping out the window when they see another car or a squirrel or a kid on a bicycle or something like that. You want the dog contained 
inside the car. That's really, really important. Don't let the dog hang their head out the window and, and you know, then you open the door to get something out of the back seat and the dog jumps out. So crate, number one best thing, crash test crate, the super best thing to get. If you can't do that, a harness or something like that, get the dog kind of contained in the back seat or in the, the not the trunk of the car, but the back of the car if you have an SUV. Those are your main, main things to think about. Um, make sure your dog has current tags on with with their name and your phone number. And I always put my cell phone number on because I'm traveling. I mean, I don't have a home phone, but I put the cell phone number because I'm traveling. I always have my cell phone with me. And that makes it easier for people to contact people, contact me. And the other thing to think about is the GPS Fi collar, which is bringing this show to you. And I'm pushing this collar because I think it's that good. This is my personal, this is Maya's personal collar. I put on Maya or Goofy when we go out. Super stylish, super easy to use. You'll set it up in five minutes. You'll, you'll love it. You're gonna have a, a GPS signal on your dog if they're going and it's not dangerous to your dog. It's been tested. It's like your cell phone for you. And you will be able to track your dog if god forbid something happens to him if you get if you order the fi collar go to try fi.com t-r-y-f-i.com and order the collar use the discount code when you go check out discount code robert cabral you'll save 25 bucks that's a big 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 savings on the collar it's a huge savings on the collar and you're going to love it i love mine so i like having that with me and make sure you take your um your charger it comes with a little charger that you can plug in it charges super fast it'll hold the charge for weeks but just bring the charger. Just I always like to charge. I always like to make sure it's charged. Also, take all your dog's medicines with you. If you're, you know, Goofy and Maya are on thyroid medicine, they need their thyroid medicine twice a day. I got to give it to them. I got to have it with me. And I keep a copy of all the current vaccines. Like, God forbid something happens with the dog and I have to prove to an animal control agency that the dog is vaccinated, particularly rabies. Rabies is the only one they're going to look for. Distemper and parvo are to protect your dog, but rabies is to protect people god forbid the dog gets accused of biting somebody or anything like that you'll need to have that with you also make sure you have a good leash and collar with you now it's not just saying oh i'm going to grab the leash and collar here check the leash and collar because when you're traveling you know your your collar's frayed or something like that or the metal is not strong or the buckle is coming undone and then you get where you're going and you don't have a collar you're you know in you're in deep i always 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 keep an extra slip lead with me that's just a great backup you know little slip lead you can get them there's a link on my site you can get them on amazon they i think they're like maybe 20 bucks or something like that it'll you'll always be sure to have something and i use it really quick if i can take the dog out i'm in a hotel a quick at night boom just put it on take them out collars you're, you're, you're fiddling with them and stuff like that so that's really what i would do now um Let's look at some other things. When you're traveling, does the hotel you're staying at, does, do they take pets? That's really important. So it, you, sometimes you have to pay a pet deposit. Don't do the bullshit thing of sneaking your dog in as a service dog. Just find a dog that takes pets and take your dog in. It's much, much easier. Um, don't let your dogs off leash in strange environments. People notoriously do that. They get to a strange place or in a strange city, a strange state, and they take the, the, the dog to the park. The dog gets spooked. The dog runs away. The dog doesn't know. The dog knows familiar parks, but if there's something unfamiliar to the dog, the dog might bolt. Very, very dangerous for the dog. Don't let that happen. So right away, take the dog you know, where you're going, keep them on leash. If you're going to use a flex leash, great. But I don't really like them for, for walking dogs. I would keep the dog really close to me. Make sure you protect the dog. It's a strange environment, strange smells, strange sights, strange sounds, and that's going to uh, trigger the dog. So I would get rid of that right away by keeping the dog really close to me, um, making sure they're structured walks, no playing, anything like that while you're away. Also, you know, if you can bring a folding crate, because it's just a good idea to have your dog contained. If you're in a hotel room or in somebody else's house, they leave the door open, your dog is gone. So having a folding crate, they fold up really small. You can put them on the roof of your car. You can put them in the trunk of your car, you can throw it in the back seat of your car, depending on the size of your dog. And, you know, I don't suggest a soft crate, although we use soft crates. If you have a dog that's really kind of spooked by anything, then you're going to have a problem by the dog escaping out of a soft crate. They can claw their way out of that. They're not going to do that out of a wire crate. And if they do, you shouldn't be traveling with that dog. So um, be aware of temperatures in other areas. I've got some notes here I'm looking at. You know, it, it, at this time of the year, it can be super cold. I mean, we're lucky. You know, we're in Southern California. It's actually really quite nice. It's, 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 it's like 50-something degrees. My mom's visiting from Florida. She thinks it's super cold. But it's rainy. It's a little damp. Not a big deal. My dog could be outside in this weather all day long, not have an issue. My dogs, of course, are inside. But you want to make sure that if you're you know, in freezing temperatures or below freezing temperatures, even worse yet, don't leave your dog outside. Don't be stupid. That's really, really, really dumb. Um, so 
if you're boarding dogs, you know, like at a dog kennel or you're having somebody come to your house to, to board your dogs, then you've got to make sure your dog is comfortable with that person. You, it's, it's not something I would recommend doing, you know, okay, you know, be here Wednesday. We're leaving, you know, we're leaving Wednesday afternoon. Don't do that. Have a, have a tryout. Have the person come over, spend a couple hours with your dog. Maybe the three of you take a walk. That's you, the dog, and the new person. Have the person go through your food with you and all that stuff. Do a meet and greet with the dog. Make sure the dog likes that person. Some dogs are not really good with certain people, and some people are not good with certain dogs. Make sure that the person you have kind of understands your dog. In other words, I've got super high drive dogs, Goofy and Maya. They really need to understand that. If somebody's going to watch Bosman, they need to understand that he needs to be carried down the stairs and, you know, all these different special things. Make a che- I make a checklist of all the special things my dog needs, medicine, time I feed him, what I feed him, how much I feed him. And then I also make a checklist and I put an emergency contact phone number on there, my contact phone number on there, my vet's contact phone number on there. And I try to alert a couple of people that I'm going to be out of town if something should happen, blah, blah, blah. So um, let's see, you know, um, you know, again, I still, I still go back to make sure your dog's wearing a collar. We, we, we can address that a hundred times. The ID tags, you know, if the dog gets picked up, you want people to be able to find you immediately. Make sure your cell phone number is on those tags. And really, you know, importantly at this time of the year is make sure that, you know, your dog is familiar with you leaving. So, you know, we have a young dog. Spend some time, you know, leave the dog overnight with somebody or have somebody stay at your house overnight because if you're just going to get to this point and then suddenly, boom, you've got to leave your dog for three, four, five days or worse yet, a couple of weeks and your dog freaks out, it's really hard on the dog to do that. Don't fly your dog as a service dog as much as you want to do that. You, you're now seeing all these stories finally coming about from the disasters that happen when people fly their dogs as service dogs. Either fly your dog in cargo as, in, as normal people do the airlines are very good at it. There's very, very, very few things that happen bad in cargo. There are, there are things that happen, right? I'm not going to say they don't, but they're few. So if you got to travel with your dog, do that or drive. Get in your car and drive where you got to go. Putting them in as a service dog and asking doctors for notes and all this stuff is just, it's bullshit. And it's really unfair to everybody, including the dog, but it's mostly unfair to, to really legitimate service dogs. And I don't like to hear that. So that's really my tips for you with your dog get your dog used to structure get your dog used to stuff being in the car being in a crate crate training is so important for the dog to understand early on because you want the dog to know it's not a big deal it's not a huge issue for to be in a crate make it you know fun start it early on when they're puppies when you first get the dog and then you'll have a dog that really likes it and will accept it all through their lives all my my dogs love to be in crates it's a positive experience um, let's hit some questions, shall we? We have a lot of questions to get to, a few, but, but, but this will give us some, uh, some groundbreaking stuff because I'll tell you, I'm so far behind on my, on my social media Ask Me Anything questions, but here we go. This first question comes from Sarah, and it says, I own a toy fox terrier named Bosco who, who at six years old went blind in both eyes. He's now 13, and I'm trying to make his life a bit more exciting. That's very good. By teaching him some new things. I tried teaching him something new earlier this year, and though he totally didn't get it all, he was so happy for the entire time, and that's really what it's about. By the way, dog training is not about success or failure. It's about the the bond that you're creating with your dog. So kudos to you, Sarah, for that. Um, I know he is intelligent enough, but not sure how to go about training a dog that can't see. My other dog who has a sight is a trick dog performer. My goal with Bosco is to get him to at least have his trick dog novice. Well, that's, you know... um, that's super great. And, you know, you're saying, how can I communicate with a dog um, that's blind? You can communicate with him, obviously, through sound. Remember that the auditory signals of a dog, the, 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 the hearing of a dog, is much more powerful than their visual signals. So you can lure and shape behaviors by using <clears throat> their nose. You can lure and shape by, by physically manipulating the dog into positions. That's not a hard thing to do. You can use um, bells and stuff like that. You can use your voice. You can put a bell on the dog too. So he kind of has a clue that uh, you know, you're know you connecting with him. You can use two bells. People do that. There's a, There's so many great things you can do, but don't stop. Just keep going. If he's not getting it, keep going. And I'll tell you something. Kudos, kudos, kudos to you for taking a 13-year-old dog and still training him. I think it's fantastic. Thank you for that. I mean, that, that, that just warms my heart. I think that's fantastic. My next question goes out to Rachel, who says, Hey, Robert, I have a rescue dog who we got about five months ago. She came with the unfortunate habit of shredding bedding and eating cat poop. 
We keep her crated whenever we leave and keep an eye on her when she's out, but she still attempts to get the litter, especially when she thinks we're not looking. We thought after months of being thwarted and scolded when she tried, she would give up, but I guess not. Do you have any other advice? Well, first of all, so a lot of times corrections and thwarting ends up getting the dog excited and the dog kind of sees it as an engagement. It's kind of like their sick, weird, twisted way to engage with you by doing these things. So you've got to make it, you know, apparently, I don't know what kind of dog you have here, but apparently the the will to or the, 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 the fear of not doing it that you've tried to instill in the dog is not working at all. So you're going to have to lock up the, you know, the the cat litter. That's just going to be the, it's just going to have to be that way. You know, get yourself one of those cat litter boxes that's really small. The opening is small. Clean the cat, clean the cat poop out often. And and maybe see if you can get hold of Jackson Galaxy. He always talks about cat stuff. He's he's brilliant. I I don't know. But I would just make it, you know, make it benign. Give your dog plenty of stuff that he has that that'll keep him active, keep him, you know, some some interactive toys and stuff like that that keeps him more focused on his own stuff and not on the cat poop. That's disgusting. Next question goes out to Georgiana Fioraru, who says, Hello, I have a Yorkshire two years old, and one week ago I take one Cane Corso, four months old. It's not going to be good, Georgiana. But from when he comes in my house, my dog don't play with me. He go away. He don't want to be around us. And it's very sad. I don't know what to do. They're both male. Can you help with some advice? Well, first of all, I'm going to tell you this right now. That's not a good mix. That's not a, a Yorkie and a Cane Corso is a very, very hard mix. But what I would do is I would take that Corso and the Corso would be crate trained from day one. And the reason I would do that is because I would teach the Coast Corso structure and respect. And I'd let him see that my Yorkie comes first. I think it's a Yorkie. Yeah, your Yorkie comes first. And by doing that, I would teach him structure and that he knows that I call all the shots. That I'm saying this is my dog. I'm saying I love this dog. I'm saying you, you need to respect this dog. And then the, the, your puppy or your, sorry, your, your Yorkie will then understand that he does come first. He gets a lot of benefits and he's going to see everything good happening to him since this dog got here. And that's what you got to change. So just bringing the Corso home at four months old, playing with him, he's great, he's fun, he's the new puppy, he's getting all the benefits and stuff like that. Bad, really, 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 really bad. Corso goes in a, in a crate. Everything happens for, for your Yorkie first. That is food, treats, toys, affection, anything, anything, anything. Your Yorkie comes first and that'll change the dynamic. Your Yorkie will be happy. Otherwise, your Yorkie can be miserable and at some point, it's not going to be good. Amber says, I got a question. I got an answer. I'm trying to start training both of my puppies. I'm working with one at a time and I'm having trouble with the, with the come command outside. They tend to get distracted and when I tell them to come, they don't listen. How do you teach this command? I don't think I'm doing it. Right. Well, first of all, watch my videos on either my member section, robertcabral.com, or on YouTube uh, on how to teach a dog to come because there's a clear way to do it. If you're not doing it right, it's not going to work. I hope you're not doing it together with them because if you are, it ain't going to happen, especially at, you don't say old they are, but they're puppies. They need to be separate. They need to understand, come solid together, like uh, to, separately. In other words, each one individually needs to understand the command. Then you can bring them together. But watch my video. It's, I can't explain it here. It's way too, it's, it's a whole half hour video. Skylar says, my dog isn't aggressive at all. He's just super excited. Anytime he sees another dog, which more often than not, makes the other dog feel threatened. How do I calm down around other dogs? Well, you don't let him meet other dogs when he's excited. And the way I do that is I focus on obedience towards me, relationship towards me, rewards coming from me. He doesn't meet dogs unless he's calm. And I can always, always, always call my dog away from other dogs. That's super important. And if your dog gets in the super hyper excitable drive around other dogs, the other dogs, one or two of them is going to trigger and they're going to they're gonna start a fight. And you're, you're going to have a fight. That whole hyper excitability always leads to fights. So I'd recommend you not getting them around other dogs until you have this whole thing figured out. That's going to be really, really, really critical. Anytime you talk about dogs that have excitement issues, prey drive issues, or anything like that, meeting other dogs, you have a problem. And I don't ever let my dogs play with other dogs that I don't know. In other words, I don't go to a dog park and say, oh, can my dog say hi to yours? doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Unless I know that dog, my dog won't meet him. If I'm at a park, my dog's playing or training more than likely, and another dog comes, I take my dog back with me and we leave. Or I keep my dog right with me, and if the other dog comes along, I tell the person, call your dog. My dog's not friendly. doesn't matter if your dog's friendly or not. You need to make sure you stick up for your dog and that your dog 
has the structure to know a solid recall, that's really important, and a solid leave it and a solid stay. Those are the three basic things that I always talk to people about having those structured onto your dog, that your dog must understand those before they ever run off leash and before they ever meet other dogs. So if willy-nilly he's meeting another dog and he's excitement, he's excitable, he's, he's, he's getting in that dog's face and that dog triggers back to him, and does something stupid, that's your fault because you let your dog do that. And once those bad things start to happen, especially with a dog with hyper prey drive or, or that, you know, that dominance drive and that, that posturing personality, it's just going to get worse. It's going because he's doing it because he's suspicious of something or he's tr provoking something. And then if something happens, then you're going to see this dog really trigger into it more and faster and you you will not fix it so start with obedience get the dog to focus on you dog is your dog it's a real long-winded answer for you but i think it's really important i always 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 talk about that that's important so anyway like i said today's show was brought to you by the fi collar you can get your own fi collar the best gps collar i've ever used um, actually the only one i've ever used i've researched tons of them but this is the only one i ever put on my dog it's easy, it works great, it looks super stylish. You can see the strap is super cool. It, um, it has a GPS signal that you can track from your phone. It goes through the satellite, so you, it's, it's on a super fast network. I think it's on the AT&T network. It only works in the United States at this point. I gotta disclaim that. And I will tell you that it's gonna cost you, I think it's 10 bucks a month, it's a steal. Trust me, less than any cell phone bill you'll have, and you'll be able to track your dog 24 seven. You'll know where they are. If you're out of town and this is on your dog, you'll know, or if it's not on your dog, you'll know where the collar is but you will know where your dog is, how much activity they've had, where they've been, everything like that. Order it, tryfi.com, T-R-Y-F-I.com, discount code, Robert Cabral will save you $25. 25 bucks just for knowing me. Who says it doesn't pay to have good friends, who have friends in good places? So, okay, that's it. Happy, happy, happy Thanksgiving. I'm very thankful for all of you. Thank you for making my life great and letting me share my passion of dogs with you. I love it. And I love having you guys here, and I love doing these podcasts and bringing you more and more fun stuff for dogs. Stay tuned for more. Check out my site, robertcabral.com, for the membership section. Follow me on social media at Robert Cabral, and I will see you next week. Thanks.